Hello there, this is Russ Buecher from Control My Nikon, and in this video we're going to take a look at what's new in version 5. I have version 5 running right here with its default gray theme, and here's version 4.3. First things you'll notice is that Control My Nikon version 5 is a lot larger and can be maximized, so it can use up the full screen. And by default here, I have the image browser embedded in the main window, but you can detach it if you like. Just go to Browser Detached, and just like version 4.3, you could take this and move it out to another screen. Now you can see the live view image here as well. And this is just a little magnetic model that we have here in a light box, and, but you can detach the live view as well and move this to another screen. So it provides a flexibility that you had in version 4.3, but it gives you the ability to attach these back into the main screen. And then you can quickly flip between the two. In fact, you can set up a keyboard shortcut, which is by default the spacebar, to flip between them. And this allows you to quickly capture an image in live view, and then flip over to image browser and view it. Control My Icon version 5 has a new image browser and that allows you to do things like double click on an image to bring up a magnifier and this is doing a true magnification right down to the original image which is quite large and uh, it'll take you right down to the pixel level if you need to. And this is a great tool for seeing if things are in focus or composed exactly how you intended them to be after you've uh, captured the shot. And you can also now export an image out to an external editor. And one of the biggest requests we had from version 4.3 was to easily be able to view an image full screen. And now all you need to do is press a shortcut key, uh, which by default is F, and it brings the image full screen, and you can still explore it. And pressing F again brings it back down to normal. Now you can even make another viewer and take this and move it out to another monitor and maximize it so it is running full screen. So it's like having two image browsers running on your computer. Those extra monitors always come in handy if you have them. Okay, I'm just gonna close that. Now on the thumb strip here, we can change which information is displayed. And by default, it's just the thumbnail and the file name, but you can go here and configure and say, I want to maybe see the histogram and the dimensions and whatever the shutter speed was. And then you can arrange these. I'm going to bring the file name down to the bottom. And you can resize it. So it really depends on the workflow for which information you might want to set here. But it can be really handy so you can see information here without having to cycle through each image and view it over here on the metadata. One of the new features is that you can also do some printing. So if I go up to the print menu and down to detail, it brings up the image, including all the metadata, and you can print this out or save it to PDF. You can also run a batch file for any one of these images and Control My Icon will send the file name, the file extension, and the folder name to a batch file of your choice and then your batch file can send it somewhere or rename it and uh, you can do additional automated post-processing with this. And the image browser allows you to also resize these panels or double click on them to hide them. Gives yourself a little bit more room. And let's bring it back up. histogram shows the current luminosity value of the pixel under the cursor. And if you go to the histogram and left click on it, it'll change to the red channel, then green, then blue, and click again to bring it back to luminosity. Now when you capture an image, the information for the EXIF metadata is entered automatically by the body but you can control which information goes into the IPTC section. So you're able to enter in information which will be embedded 
in these IPTC fields. And to do that, all you need to do is go to the View menu and Metadata. And you just enter in the information here that you want to be embedded in your image. So the next time you capture an image, it will be embedded. And you can see it right here. Now any of your batch shooting data, if you're doing batch shooting, will also be uh, embedded here as well. If you are shooting raw images, an additional .xmp file will be created with this information embedded into it. Okay, I'm just going to clear this out. Let's take a look at Live View. So now, to get into Live View, just click on Live View. And um, on the previous version, when you wanted to close Live View, of course, you would click it again. But in the new version, to close Live View, you click on the Close button. And the reason for that is, in the new version, if you want to quickly cycle between what you've shot and what you're browsing, you just press the space bar. So I'll press space, space, and space and it flips between the image browser and live view. So I could be in live view here and I might autofocus on something, capture the shot. Now I want to see it, so I just press the space bar and here it is. Press space bar again, you're back in live view. Now one of the big differences in live view in version 5 is that there's no longer a sidebar on the right hand side but rather all those sidebar controls have been moved out to layers, which is over here. So it's a lot larger than that sidebar area was, and it's a little bit easier to use. Now some of the new functionality we have here, is we have a separate shoot button here, and that's exactly the same shoot button as you see over here. It does the exact same thing. But sometimes you might want to do something like this and hide the main control panel and only have the live view image shown. Because now you can press the shoot button, press the space bar to review your image, press it again to get back to live view. So this new button allows you to do that. If you recall in version 4.3 it had a focus pad as a way to nudge the focus around, but now we've replaced that with these buttons. So if you press this button here, it changes the focus. And the amount it changes is set right here. So you have fine controls, zooming in and out, and coarse controls. Now to change the zoom levels, all you need to do is click on any one of these four buttons and most bodies have up to four levels of zoom so you just click on two, three, four to zoom in and I think the most useful one is zoom level three and you can still focus and we also have the ability in version five now to pan around the image. You can set this up with the keyboard shortcuts and all I'm doing is pressing a key in the keyboard to go down and up, left, and right. So this lets you explore your image while it's zoomed in. So maybe you want a nice shot of this right here. You could double click on it. But if you're unsure whether the body has really achieved the optimal focus, you can use the focus nudge buttons here. Uh, I think going the wrong way there. Go back this way to find the best focus. And once the focus looks good for you, is press the shoot button to capture. And like version 4.3 there is also a separate viewer for live view and this is a live view monitor and it does not show any of the image data overlays such as the focus box or grid lines. So if you have a focus puller or maybe a client who would like to view uh, what you are seeing in live view, uh, you could take this and move it out to a separate monitor and point that monitor over in their direction and uh, so they don't have to look at your main control my icon window which has a lot of you know extra controls and data on it they, uh, that they might not understand or need. So I'm going to just close this. Let's try recording some video. 
first thing I'm going to do since I'm using a D800 is I'm going to turn it on to video mode. So I'm going to close live view. So on the D800 I flip the video mode lever to movie recording mode and now I'll just turn live view back on. And most bodies uh, you don't need to actually flip the lever but some of them you need to. And so now I could see here I'm at a 16 uh, by 9 aspect ratio. And if I want to record, all I need to do is press the record button. And new in version 5, it shows you how much time has elapsed and how much time is remaining during your recording. And when you're done recording, all you need to do is click on this button again. And also new in version 5 is the automatic transfer of the video file from the camera to your computer. And you can view this now in the image browser. So I'll go back to the browser, we'll look at the video that's been captured. If you give it a moment here, it'll bring up the video player and you just need to have QuickTime installed in your computer. And you can press play here or stop and you can review your video. If you really wanted to, you could bring it up full screen and play it here. Let's go back into live view. And I'm just going to turn the video mode lever back to stills. Something that's been enhanced in version 5 is the use of profiles. In version 4.3, profiles were optional, but in version 5 now they are required and there's a lot of advantages to this because each profile contains pretty well all the different settings that you can set within Control Mind Icon. By using these profiles, you save the settings you need for each type of workflow. And the biggest thing that has really changed in Control Mind Icon is how it approaches workflows. In fact, we have a separate workflow menu. In version 4.3, if you want to do an HDR, or a focus stack, you know, you have to go to many different places within the program and the workflow were dissimilar. They, they weren't related to one another, it seemed. So we've brought those together in a much more common format and we've added the ability to have a separate image viewer for those images you've captured on your workflow. So for example, in focus stacking, let's try capturing a stack and see how it works. So here I'm looking at my live view image and I'm just going to do a quick stack. I'm going to do, oh, let's say five slices, 100 steps apart, and I'll click on preview. And you'll see here as Control Mind Icon drives a focus motor and changes the focus. Let's try a capture. Now in version 4.3, you would need to go back to your image browser or maybe an external image browser to see the images you captured. But while you're capturing or after capturing, you can look right here and you can grab the scrubber bar here and you could see the changes of focus. Now you can click on any one of these thumbnails and press the G key on the keyboard to bring it up full screen. So you never have to go back to your image browser. You can do all of it right here. But if you want to, you can still go to your image browser and see the images that you've captured. So the system now has the ability to keep what you have on the image browser separate from what you've just captured. And this is great if you don't have a lot of room on your screen because when you're capturing your focus stack, you might want to have live view up and see the images you're capturing at the same time. And pretty well all the different workflows that we have here, such as HDR, burst capture, batch, time lapse, and stop motion, all allow you to view your captured images in this manner. A new and focused stacking for version 5 is the ability to use the stack shot. And the stack shot is a product from Cognosys that is really a motorized rail. It's a very high quality rail. And instead of using Control Mind Icon to drive the focus motor within your lens, Control Mind Icon instead 
will drive the stack shot, which will physically move your camera closer and further uh, to your subject. And this allows you to capture images one slice at a time. It's very accurate and is very popular with people who are doing a lot of focus stacking. So let's take a look at some of the different workflows that we have. And we can go to long exposure. And this one just steps you through the various things you need to do to accurately capture a long exposure image. Now it has a built-in calculator, so if you know what the shutter speed and the f-stop is, it'll calculate how many seconds your exposure needs to be, and this will use bulb mode. And many new Nikon bodies allow tethered bulb mode. If you don't have a newer Nikon body that allows this, you can still use a DSUSB and a DSUSB is an external device that connects to your USB port and your camera with cables and will trigger the camera for you so you can use tethered bulb mode that's very popular with uh, astrophotography and this will even step you through the process you need to capture a dark frame which is a frame of nothing but noise that your sensor produces and then you can later in external applications deduct that frame of noise from your original shot and it's much more accurate than having the camera body doing the noise reduction for you. Okay, let's take a look at some other workflows. New in version 5 is stop motion workflow. So this workflow allows you to capture a series of images that you can export out to an external application such as QuickTime and that will allow those images to come together into a stop motion video. And uh, this is a very popular thing to do with a DSLR and it's not difficult to do at all by using this particular workflow. One of the problems of course if you're going to make a stop motion movie is knowing how much to move the camera in between shots because sometimes you can lose track of what the previous shot was and you may have moved the camera or the subject too much and it doesn't look very good in stop motion. So what this allows you to do is to capture an image and then view that captured image as an onion skin in live view so you can capture another image and then you're able to easily play back your stop motion video. Okay, so let's capture several frames of a stop motion workflow and I'll just uh, click on capture here. Now this won't be a terribly interesting uh, stop motion but you'll get the idea how it works. Okay, so I'm going to uh, move the camera a little bit just so I get a little bit of motion and I'm going to enable live view scrubbing which means that this current image is going to be overlaid on top of whatever live view is currently seeing out the camera and I'll just change the opacity a little bit okay I'll just move the camera a bit and you can see here the onion skin effect I could change the opacity of it and we'll have a separate tutorial video on how to do all this stop motion and I could turn off the onion skinning if I want but I um, might look at this and say okay it looks like it's uh, changed enough so I'll capture and now the most recent image has now been onion skins. Okay, let's try to move the camera again. Okay, so now I'll try my next shot. And at this point we might want to replay this, so I can just grab the scrubber and go back and we could see it moving and I could turn my onion skin off and I can see it right up here on the preview. And anytime you can play what you have, and you can assign shortcut keys to all this, and it makes capturing all the images you need for stop motion very easy. But again, check out the tutorial on stop motion and we'll show you how to create an actual uh, stop motion movie. Okay, I'm just gonna disable this. Okay, let's take a look at the other workflows. So I've got the workflows, time-lapse, 
And uh, just like the intervalometer in version 4.3, you can set a start time and an end time, or you could just start and end when you press the buttons. And I'll set the shot interval for five seconds, and uh, let's do three shots. Now, new in version 5 is the ability to make an HDR time lapse. So when you put a check mark here, it will use the settings you have set up in the HDR workflow to capture additional images so you get a full HDR range for your time lapse. But I'll just disable this for now and we'll capture. And you can see it displays them in here. So as this is being captured, you can sit back and review them here in this small mini browser or you can go to the main browser. Okay, so here's the images that we captured for our time lapse. Let's take a look at some of these other workflows. And we also have the batch workflow. The batch workflow has been really updated for version 5. Version 4 was the first time we did batches at all. And uh, basically what batches allows you to do is to import some data into the system, such as maybe a class list if you're shooting pictures of uh, students at a school, or maybe a product list if you're shooting products. And you can import your data from a comma to limited file, where you just import it right here. But new in version 5 is the ability to import from an ODBC source. And when you do that, such as maybe I'm importing from a Microsoft SQL Server database that you have on the corporate network, uh, you can bring that data in and import it into Controlman Icon, and then the Controlman Icon will reference that data when you enter in a uh, activation code. Now, if you didn't want to import any data at all, version 5 also allows you to use an external data source. So you could say, well, instead of importing the data, I just want my activation query to go directly out against maybe an Oracle database or a SQL database out there somewhere and to bring back only the data I need that I need to embed into my folder and file names and uh, IPTC data. But let's look at an example. Uh, it, Controlman Icon comes with just some sample data here. And uh, what we're looking for here is the batch ID. There's a new job ID field and the batches now go from BD1 all the way to BD9 so you can have any of this information here embed it into a file name, folder name, or to the IPTC data. You can also add additional records here and edit them. So, uh, but let's use this one here. We'll use batch ID 10. So if I type in 10 and activate, it looks up the information and all you need to do now is capture a shot. Now, if you had gone into the metadata and set it to store this information, then it will be embedded into the image file. So I'll just type in uh, several here. We'll put the batch ID and the first data field here as well. So now when I capture, and I look at my browser, you'll see that the data that I had here for batch ID 10, Richard and the batch ID are stored here as your IPC data. So now when you take this image file and you put it into another maybe image archiving system that you may have, you can search for this information by searching through the IPTC data. So it's really handy and we have a lot of users around the world now in laboratories and museums and doing product and school shoots um, that are using this type of functionality to embed data into their images so they can later on easily manage those images because after a while you get thousands of images and you don't know which one belongs to who. This allows you to easily keep track of that. And as in 4.3,
you can also use a barcode scanner with this to enter this activation code for you and activate it. Now when you're batch shooting, you can also change the data that you see here. And so I'm going to just include city, copyright, country, credit, and so on. And now when we look at this information, when I take a shot where data has been embedded, it shows up here as well. And you could also take it in your main image browser and show it here too. The image browser also allows you to search for this data. So you can go search and say, I'm looking for Teresa. And it brings you that one image that has the name Teresa in it. Okay, let's try another workflow. If we go up here to HDR, Just like version 4.3, we can bring over some shutter speeds, and let's go 130, 160, and 1, 125. So this will allow to capture now three images of varying exposures. And you can then take these images out to an external program and combine them so you have an HDR image. And you can just use the scrubber bar to take a close look at these images and you can see that they're changing in intensity and you can do the same thing here as well in the image browser. Let's try this again except I'm going to bring up live view to help compose the image. Let's focus on this one instead. And I'm going to add two more so instead of 130 I'll go 115 and I'll also go 1250. And you can move these. Okay, so here we'll capture five images of varying exposure. When you're in live view, the live view will darken like this as it's capturing. But in here, you're still able to explore these images as they're being captured. Okay, we have a lot more range this time. So we go from a very light to very dark. And with Controlman Icon, it really helps to have the ability to put one of these histograms in the thumb strip. So uh, here I could see that the exposure is moving every time I take a shot. And you can check here quickly to see whether you have the correct exposure ranges for successful HDR processing. Okay, let's try one more. Let's try Burst. So in the Burst workflow, you just enable it and specify how many images that you want to capture. Okay, in most bodies, you need to set it to continuous mode on the body and uh, for burst mode you should also disable autofocus because it will attempt to phase focus uh, for each shot otherwise. So I'll do that now. Okay, let's give it a try. And there's our burst. A burst works really well when you use it with the live view motion trigger you could set up the trigger target to be something like a bird feeder and when a bird arrives it'll detect the motion trigger this burst functionality and you'll capture a bunch of great images of that bird and I'm just going to close some of these tabs here so I can go over to the view menu and I can close the metadata and I'm going to disable those workflows now all the triggers are here under the trigger menu so uh, web triggers, just like in version 4.3, allow you to 
command control my Nikon to communicate with your camera via a web browser. So this web browser can be on your computer or it could be on your smartphone or a tablet. Now new in version 5 is there's a lot more available actions that you can do. So if you look here you can see there's things like changing the magnification or zooming or panning or capturing images, starting an HDR sequence, connecting or disconnecting. You can use any of these with a web trigger. And we'll have separate tutorial videos on each one of these triggers and workflows. You can have a sound trigger, so all you need to do is connect it to a microphone. And then select one of those actions. So maybe on a loud noise, you can have it capture an image or a video. You can have a TCP IP trigger and this is basically a trigger through network communication. On the previous version you could send commands to control my Nikon from another program using Windows messaging. It wasn't very reliable so we've changed that in version 5 you can use a network connection and this is a TCP IP connection it's like an internet connection so you can write a program or use Telnet to send commands to control my Nikon and it uses any of the other commands you saw in the other triggers and you could connect, you can disconnect, capture an image and so on and it just uses an IP address and a port and you can do this from your computer or an app that you might write for a smartphone or a tablet. We also have speech triggers. Now a speech trigger allows you to define a particular word or phrase with a action and all you need to do is speak that word into your microphone and it will cause that action to be triggered. Same functionality really in version 4.3 main difference is that the speech trigger is now built into version 5 instead of existing as a separate standalone program. Okay let's take a look at another trigger the motion trigger. Just like in version 4.3 you can set up a target in your live view image and anytime there's any motion around here then you can cause control an icon to trigger an action. So for example capturing an image. And we still have support for fidgets and these are external devices that you need to purchase. They're basically sensors. You can have light sensors and infrared sensors and, and uh, maybe even vibration sensors and when those sensors are triggered uh, they will send a signal control my Nikon which will cause an action such as any one of these to occur so you might have a vibration sensor that causes the camera to capture an image and I'll just turn these triggers off so let's take a look at some of these other features in the new version. Uh, in tools here we have more themes. We now have 101 themes and the ability to change the hue and the saturation of the themes. And we went through these themes. We cleaned them up a little bit. So you should be able to find a theme in here that uh, works really good for you. And we've enhanced the shortcuts, so now you can use different keyboard combinations. You could, for example, have a Control-Alt-Shift-S uh, for a particular command. And you can also use the F keys. And by default, Controlman Icon comes with several of these already preset, but you can go in here and set them anytime. And here you can see we have the spacebar set up to toggle the image browser and live view. In the Preferences screen, we have some different options now and uh, one of those is the ability to use 3DX wear to control the panning and the focus in live view and that's um, made by 3D connection and it's a space mouse. So it's a special type of mouse that allows you to maneuver in three-dimensional space and is used in quite a few uh, CAD programs and uh, some different graphics programs. If you have one of those then you can just enable it here and it works real nice for controlling the pan and the focus. 
We've also added additional timing options here for slower lenses so we don't send commands too fast to them. You can increase the timing here to uh, make those lenses respond a little bit more nicely with Controlman Icon. And here we have the option to auto launch a batch file after every capture. So it's great for post processing if you might want to rename a file, send it across the network and have another application work on it. Now we have additional support for the DSUSB device which is an external triggering device. It's very popular with astrophotographers and now it supports the DSUSB 1 and the DSUSB 2 and the DSUSB IR1 which we had supported in version 4.3. Now if you're using Control My Icon on a very small monitor, we also have a UI magnifier. And this lets you take a closer look at what's on the screen. It's different, however, from the image magnifier. The image magnifier uses a true representation of the underlying data from the very large image you're looking at here. Whereas this UI magnifier really just magnifies what is sitting on your monitor. And also new in Controlman Icon version 5 is the ability to set the clock on the body. So we go to Tools menu, Set Clock, hit Yes, and now the time on your body matches the time on your computer. And that's it. That's what's new in Controlman Icon version 5. Lots of new features here, and we have tutorial videos on most of them. So have fun, and happy tethering.